Can you hear me now? You can hear me now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, friends, distinguished guests, those who I hope are watching on YouTube, either live as we broadcast now or later. Um, I'll keep the Paris notices very short at the beginning because I'm sure our YouTubers won't want to listen to a lot of it. Um, please make certain your phones are off, uh, everyone, if you will be so kind. Uh, if there is an alarm, it will be for real. Um, follow the instructions from Jeanette uh, and the museum staff, uh, evacuating either at the back of the room uh, or at the front here behind me. One thing I will say, uh, and it probably won't come as any surprise, our next meeting was due to be a meeting next Thursday at Acton. Uh, next Thursday, sadly, is now one of the proposed National Rail Strike Days, so we have taken the decision to postpone that meeting next Thursday uh, because uh, many of you will, I'm sure, have difficulties getting to Acton uh, from parts of the uh, capital that are served by National Rail. Right, um, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. James Fowler, uh, from the Essex Business School at the University of Essex. Uh, James has spoken to us before uh, in one of our pre-recorded presentations during lockdown on the uh, financial and business performance of London Transport. Uh, he's on sort of similar territory, but with a particular angle tonight. Um, we're delighted that we can do it live, and you can see and hear him and question him. Uh, and the presentation, uh, as you see on the screen behind you, uh, is after Ashfield, LT's post-war chairman, 1948 to 1987. It sounds like a, a mastermind subject, doesn't it? <laughs> or cl closely defined by subject and date. James, the floor is yours. I will switch this mic on. Brilliant. Um, Barry, thank you very much indeed. Um, I trust everyone can, uh, can hear me. Brilliant. Super. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, I just want to say a few words. Um, firstly, thank you all very much indeed for inviting me here to speak this evening. It's a, a huge pleasure, a real privilege, um, and I'm very, very flattered to be here. So I've been on a number of other occasions before, sitting out there, um, uh, watching some amazing performances from some extremely experienced former and indeed serving senior officials in the transport world. Um, and I've been amazed at what they've been able to produce. And I hope to be able to interest and enthrall you this, or this evening even in the same way that I was um, on those previous occasions. So um, having spoken about that, I'm also conscious that sitting in front of me are sort of serried ranks of experience throughout the transport industry for many, many years, if not decades. And um, I think I probably need to explain before I begin, in a sense, by what right I, I stand here, or at least what my background is in, in reality to all this. So forgive me, I'll, I'll do that very briefly, because I'm conscious of the sort of the level of experience and understanding that I have um, uh, here. And then I'll talk about the structure of what I'm going to go through this evening uh, and how that's going to play out. So essentially, i am come to this from an academic background. I confess I have never worked in the transportation industry in any capacity whatsoever. What I know... Okay, is on the basis of probably almost 10 years now of trawling through the Transport for London archives. Um, and I must put in a word here for those excellent archivists, Tamara Thornhill and Melissa McGreechan, who, without whom I couldn't have done any of this. And indeed the LTM Library, um, who've also been immensely helpful to me um, uh, these past 10 years. Supplement all of that with materials from the London Metropolitan Archive, the National Archive, one or two other smaller archives and so on. And what you see behind me at the moment essentially is the fruit of my labour, some of which I'm going to share with you um, uh, this evening. So there you go. That's where I come in. So I'm afraid I can't match your practical experience, all right? Not even for a second. Um, and I'm very, very conscious, having been here before and indeed talked to some of you in interview, just how much you know. Um, but I have gone through the organisation, I think, very thoroughly. Um, I have gone over it from a variety of different angles, and that essentially is the basis of what I'm going to speak to you about this evening. How am I going to do that? Um, well, I'm going to speak to you, I hope, for a little over an hour to ensure there's time for questions at the end. I'm going to do it roughly in two sections. Although this is all about what happened after Ashfield, I am going to spend a lot of time with him first because I don't think you can really understand much about what happened afterwards 
until we've had a good look at him. So we're going to have a good look at him, and I'm going to advance to you what I hope is a novel thesis, or at least something that's a new perspective on his activities um, uh, during his time here at London Transport. Having done that, I'm going to take a little pause, a sip of water, an opportunity perhaps for a recap, any questions at that stage, and then I'm going to conclude by moving through the post-war chairman and just offering some observations on how they chose to navigate the, I hesitate to say minefield, but uh, let's say minefield that they were bequeathed, all right? And it was a lot tougher, I think, than some people, or at least a lot of the current literature that's out there about this might suggest. So there you go. That's roughly what I'm going to go through, um, and I look forward to hearing from you come the end. The issues, then. Um, I think the post-war chairmen suffer unfairly, in my opinion. Um, Non-entities and placement. I looked at that. I felt, ouch. Okay, distinct sense of pain. I don't think that's fair, um, and I'm going to challenge that um, uh, as we go along. Their difficulty, of course, is that through hmm, no fault of their own, partial fault of their own, we'll talk about the nuances as we came along, they are inevitably associated with decline. All right? There's no way of getting around that. Fewer people were traveling on the system in 1985 than there were in 1945. And as we know, that decline was pretty inoxorable throughout all that period. So it's difficult, isn't it? You might be a superb manager, and I'm going to argue that many of them were. They might be a superb leader. All right? But if the organization that you are leading and managing is heading south, it's hard to avoid that taint. So I think we need to unpick a little bit of that. But that's essentially the central charge, I would say, that lies behind the criticism, all right? My question is, is coincidence causality, all right? I'll leave you to decide that as we go along. What else? Okay, this man, all right, the famous open portrait, all right? At the height of his powers, master of all he sees, omniscient, okay, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. And some of you may have read this some... Um, I think, fascinating little piece by Frederick Menzler, who was essentially chief accountant of the uh, London Passenger Transport Board for many, many years. And in 1950, a couple of years after Ashfield had died, he wrote the fairly well-known Lord Ashfield and the Public Corporation. It's actually quite a lot about Frank Pick as well, which makes it doubly useful, but it's mostly about Ashfield. Um, and it's, I think, very, very laudatory. That's understandable. Why should it not be? Um, but in that sense, we have to search somewhere for the critical voice here, all right? So it explains all his triumphs, but it does so, I think, sort of looking down from the mountain peak in reverse. It doesn't talk much about how the ascent was made, I suggest, all right? It looks at how he operated, and I think it is, it's kind of understandable. It's a sort of very nice, very polite way of, of finishing a man's career and wanting to celebrate his achievements. Nevertheless, it makes a number of interesting observations, not least this issue over the power of personality, which is something that I'm going to return to quite frequently as we go through here. So we have two issues then. The association with decline, whether or not you like that or otherwise, unfortunately they're tied to it, and they're coming in the wake of this guy who essentially is viewed as you know, the person who, who can scarcely be bettered, all right? And again, the Mensler, um, uh, the, the Mensler document, you know, London, the Lord Ashford and the, 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 the Public Corporation, I think, epitomizes that. So is it a fair comparison? And this is, I suppose, my job this evening. I'm going to try, as objectively as I can, to weigh the scales here. And I'm going to explain to you how I'm going to do that. Um, the first question I'm going to ask of all these nine men who you see behind me is, did they really understand the past? All right. In other words, they were handed this parcel, this baton, whatever you want to um, call it, okay, this museum, this national treasure almost, I think, that London Transport World sort of edges into from time to time. Now, did they really understand where it had come from? Okay, we'll have a look at that. Secondly, this thing that they were handed over, okay, was it a sustainable legacy? All right, and I, I'm going to sort of critique that, I think, quite sharply in a lot of ways. I hope in ways that perhaps people might not necessarily expect. And finally, the reason why I've put this in bold, this is the only bit that I think really sticks to them. I'm going to ask, OK, so perhaps they didn't understand the past. That might not have been their fault. And perhaps they were handed something that was unsustainable anyway, which was hardly their fault either. But did they understand the new? All right? Did they understand the world that they had come into and what they had to achieve during their period of incumbency? And that's perhaps where I'm going to be the sharpest critic of them. All right, as, as we go through. So there you are. I hope you understand sort of the structures that I'm going to situate what I'm talking about in um, before, we, uh, before we move on. So Ashfield the legend. Um, I'm going to ask some questions about this as we go along. There we go. 
Creator of London's transport or creator of London transport. Now, that may seem rather semantic, all right? But if you look at things like this poster, which you see here, it says there, creator of London transport. And I think a lot of the time, in the, certainly in the popular imagination, he's kind of doubly credited, all right, with both creating this organization, London transport, although, of course, it's gone by a variety of different names. But there's this kind of idea that at the same time, he also created this thing, London's transport, which, of course, is not true. I would argue quite strongly. He, what he did, all right, was something else. Create a unified, centralised system of governance for running London transport. Now, I understand that for many of you in the room, okay, you understand all of that, and that's perhaps rather obvious to you. But I want to make that point at the start, all right, because I want to draw a distinction between the organisation he created and the physical reality of, of buses, trams, trains, and so on and so forth moving around the capital. All right, that's important. And note what I say there, a unified centralised governance okay, of most of London's transport. And of course, I'm sure we're all very well aware of the bits that didn't fall into that. It's important. We're just laying out the foundations here. He's celebrated, I argue, for reaching that destination, all right? The sort of glorious ascension. The man who created the organization for which I imagine many of you spent your working lives in and has come to be seen, I would suggest, and I'm going to challenge this, as the only rational answer to the, Lund to, to the capital's transport problems. Actually, I think it's a more, a more subtle thing than that, and I'm going to unpick that in just a moment. But there you are. He's celebrated as the guy who did it, okay? The guy who welded all these fiziparous tramways, small bus companies, tubes, other bits and bobs into something that was rational and viable and commonsensical, all right? Commonsensical. We'll talk about this in there just a second. The question that I'm going to ask is, the journey about getting there was either forgotten about um, or if it was remembered, it was ignored. And part of the problem is that he didn't leave any memoirs behind him. All right? So there was no way of unpicking and tracing that journey back. All right? The glorious destination was fantastic. This wonderful unified thing, the London Passenger Transport Board, LT, etc., etc. But how had he got there? And I think we don't ask enough questions about all of that. So, where does this lead us to? Okay? If we say it's wonderful and excellent and superb, well, who desired it? Okay? We need to pick this apart as well, because we now need to, we're going to explore a lot about why cars became so popular. Who really wanted this system? Was it always an obvious, commonsensical outcome that there should be a unified system running London's transport? And for how long was that going to last? All right? Once alternatives began to make themselves felt. These were the questions that the latter chairman had to answer. Right? Ashfield didn't have to answer those questions once he'd achieved what he wanted to do. The people who came afterwards did. And that's, I think, part of their challenge that they had to deal with, and he did not. So I'm going to give you a little list now of what I regard as the true achievements, my thesis. Okay? I'd be interested to see whether you agree or disagree with me at the end of all of this. First of all, I'd just like to draw your attention to the, the photo. All right? I vastly prefer this one. This, to me, all right, is the real Albert Stanley. All right? He's a bit of a bruiser. You can see that. He's got the death stare going on. All right? This is the man who welded together London Transport as an organization. Not the guy in the painting by Sir William Alpen, All right, He'd achieved everything by then. He was just sitting back, watching it all roll in, the honors accumulating. All right? This man, okay, in the early part of the 20th century, achieved that. And it was a much, much tougher road than I think is commonly acknowledged. And I'm going to look into and explore it in a bit more detail. So his first thing that he had to achieve all right, was this idea that monopoly, or even a limited monopoly, the London traffic combine as it was in those days, probably about 60%, maybe two-thirds of London's traffic by about 1912, 1920, thereabouts, was all about efficiency and not exploitation. And remember that in the early part of the 20th century, that's not how people saw things at all. People wanted there to be competition. Competition was efficiency. Competition was how fares were driven down, how innovation was pushed forward, how new forms of transport made themselves felt. All right? This was capitalism. All right? But he had to achieve a change around or play his part in changing that view and say, look, if you grant me monopoly powers, or even just oligopical, you know, I suppose oligopolistic powers, all right? that's okay, that's safe, okay? it's safe with me, because I'm going to change a conversation here, all right? away from the idea that competition actually spurs efficiency, spurs low affairs, spurs consumer choice, to an idea that competition is actually inherently wasteful, 
And of course, many of you will be aware of an incident, the so-called pirate buses later on, 1923, 24, which was enormously helpful to him in demonstrating, as he would say, that competition was inherently wasteful. But let's remember that this was not an accepted perspective necessarily across the political spectrum when he began. All right? So the first thing he had to do was change a lot of minds and suggest that unification, as it says, brings economies of scale and scope rather than all right, crushing the small operator okay, and restricting customer choice. It's a more important changeover in attitude than I think is often accepted. So what did he do? Well, he relied a lot on what had happened in the US. Surprise, surprise, that's where he'd been working. And the idea was that, you know, at least in the famous case from Oakes at Al Brandeis, all right, he said, or Lou Brandeis claimed that American railroads could save a million dollars a day, he claimed, okay, if one, they worked towards amalgamation, and two, and this is one of the most interesting things of all, they began to collect detailed statistical accounts of their activities. Now, if you look back at the minute books of the early years of the Underground Electric Railway um, Company that Yerkes essentially set up, they're fairly sparse in terms of what they talk about. They're usually, the first item on them, surprise, surprise, is what dividends are going to be divided up to the shareholders. Okay, item one, all right? And it doesn't really go much beyond there. As you push through the minutes, and I know that the TFL archive is involved in a program at the moment to get them all digitized, which is a, a, you know, amazing and fantastic. As you push through them, what you discover, especially after the arrival of our, well, Stan, Albert Stanley in 1907, they begin to pick up far, far more statistical information until after 1912, where you have these extraordinarily sort of thick minute books, which are called statistical books, really. They're not minute books anymore, which are held at the London Metropolitan Archive, which show the level of detail of statistics down to individual bus stops, all right, and the estimated takings from each one. Now, that's a kind of revolution in the space of about oh, five years, maybe, five, six years, in the kind of quality and density of information that the UERL, as it was at that time, is beginning to pick up. Note that that's also coincident with their amalgamations with things like the London General. Okay, they start sweeping up the tramways at this point, and they bring a lot of the tubes into their ambit too. So you've got two things going on here. You've got the spread of amalgamation, i.e. this is the point where the organization begins to get knitted together by, um, by Stanley, and the kind of information that's inform it's available to him to make those kind of management decisions is, I couldn't say, a thousandfold more sophisticated. It's, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. So a very, very profound change in the way in which the organization is being managed and the kind of quality of information that's available to Albert Stanley and indeed all his managers at this period. Bigger is better. <clears throat> And here we have it, okay? Centralized rational command and control exercised through detailed statistical accounting. And just to back it up, in 1911, the passage of the Railway Companies Accounts and Returns Act goes through, and that obliges railway companies to collect statistics at a kind of level of detail that they have never had to do so before. However, Albert Stanley's got there already, okay? He's jumped the gun, all right? London Transport, or what's going to become London Transport, it's called the London Traffic Convoy, and at about this point, has already got there. They're ahead of the curve. So, what he leaves behind, I suggest, and this goes, this goes on and on and on and on for decades, decades after 1911, all the way up, and I think it's only seriously challenged in the 1980s, but we'll come to that, all right, is this idea that LT is governed by a doctrine of rational efficiency, all right? It's a centralized system. Information flows into the center. There's a small group of very professional expert managers, like the man behind me, all right, who synthesize all that information, and that allows them, all right, a kind of omniscience about what's going on, all right? Now, that's all very revolutionary in 1911. My question as we, fall, flew, as we move forward through this talk is, how revolutionary is it by 1951, by 1961, by 1971? But does the organization change? Okay, does it? We'll see, we'll see. So that's one of his legacies, okay? One of his legacies that he leaves behind. It has a, a very, very long, um, I suppose, afterlife, shall we say. There we go. Fear of commercial uh, uh, monopoly overcome, partly, of course, by the pirate buses. We'll come back to them. What else does he manage to imprint upon 
LT, right? Well, he's got a, a completely different problem as well as this economic problem. The economic problem is how to persuade people that monopoly is okay. It's safe, all right? And he does that by kind of explaining that only centralized organizations can have access to this kind of incredibly dense information that allows him to make rational decisions. But he's got another problem, and it's these two men, all right? Some of which, some of whom you might recognize there. We've got Edgar Speyer, slightly over to my right, okay? And Charles Yerkes, okay, slightly more over to, um, to your right of the screen that you can see behind me. And I've chosen those cartoons um, because they were not necessarily particularly well regarded um, by large sections of the British public, by large sections of prominent conservative politicians at the time, and in general, there was a suspicion, and we'll come on to why there was a suspicion about them in a moment. So the next thing that Ashfield did is, apart from persuading everyone that Monopoly was okay, um, because it was efficient, he persuaded everyone that he was honest, he was British, um, and that he was patriotic as well. And I'm going to argue that that was just as important as his managerial innovations, for reasons we're going to have a look at in just one moment. It became really, really critically important during the course of the First World War, but it was important beforehand as well. Because if you think about what's being said when you choose to concentrate all the transport um, in the capital city, after all, it's an imperial city in those days, and what you're really saying is if you're going to do that, not only do you have to be happy with the idea that consumer choice is going to fall quite a lot, you also have to be happy with placing all that power in the hands of one person in the end of the day, the chairman, Ashfield, the person he would like that to be in his hands. But to do that, you've got to persuade everyone that you're okay, all right? And that's harder than you might think because of the activities of these two, all right? So there we are, Charles Yerkes. I think we probably know all about him, okay? Let's say that he was dynamic. I think that's probably fair, isn't it? Okay, we probably owe him quite a lot, actually, in a lot of ways in terms of fusing the early railway companies together. Um, let's say that he was dishonest. I think he was, basically. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of all of that because I'm sure you in the audience know the details of all of that. But he was, all right? And essentially, here you have this rather brash American um, who's known to be dishonest. He's known to have spent time in prison in America, actually, before coming to... Um, um, London, and his big scheme is let's get all, let's unify London transport so I have more power in my hands. So the question to the British public is well, do you really want to do that? Okay, do you really want to do that? And the answer, at the very least, I think is probably no, or at the very least, they're going to be highly suspicious of that. All right, now luckily, I think for Yerkes, he dies just at the end of 1905, and that's fortunate because his whole financial pile of cards more or less falls down, um, thus confirming the worst suspicions of many of his investors um, uh, in the year or two that follows his death. But he leaves behind him this kind of, I would suggest, lingering taint that London's transport in some way is you know, the, the sort of the abode, shall we say, of unscrupulous speculators, okay? Running various trusts about, about the sort of the provenance of which is no, not really known by anyone. It certainly isn't British investors, okay? And you're still getting questions in the 20s, really, the early 20s in Parliament, from people who say, well, the London Transport isn't really a British company at all. It's a kind of nest of sort of American speculators and some Dutch shareholders. We don't know anything about it, okay? And people are very, very suspicious of that. So, we leave Yerkes behind because he dies, um, and we pick up Edgar Speyer, who's his kind of right-hand man in the city of London. Okay? I'm going to say that he was honest, um, he was effective at what he did, but unfortunately, in the climate of the time, he was also a German and he was Jewish. And that was a massive problem even before the First World War broke out. <laughs> All right? So you're kind of doubling down on this kind of taint, if you will, about how London transport is governed and by whom. So here are these, both these characters both saying, look, this organization needs to be unified, and that means putting a lot of power in our hands. And the public and the press and prominent conservative politicians are saying, well, we're not sure about that. And you can begin to see the kind of the scale of the problem at a social level that Albert Stanley has got to deal with as well. Bearing in mind, he's not entirely, in a sense, got a clean sheet himself, because although he was born in Derbyshire, he went off to America when he was eight, he's changed his name, and then he's reappeared in 1907 having married an American, and to his, to all intents and purposes, you could argue, a naturalized American citizen, although maybe not officially so. So you begin to see the difficulties that he, he begins to pick up. So there are serious problems with social and political legitimacy here, right? Especially over the creation of a monopoly and who it is you're going to entrust that power with. All right? So here is a comment by an MP all right, in 1990. London's transport is run by a cabal of hook-nosed patriots who sing God save the king in broken English. All right? We don't like these guys. 
<laughs> and we don't want them running London Transport, and we sure as heck don't want it all concentrated in one person's hand. Okay, so this is a real problem. You get similar opinions raised on the, 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 the what was formerly the London County Council at that time as well by similar people. So you can see the scale of the issue. So it all reaches a bit of a climax in 1918. Um, and at that point, Sir Albert Stanley is now the president of the Board of Trade. Um, this gentleman, Noel Pemberton Billing, stands up and he says the following. Okay, lifted this straight out of Hansard. So, yeah, is he actually a German by the name of Nuttmeyer? Whether or not his name has been adopted and whether he holds his uh, position owing to the influence of the German Jew, who by this point, by the way, Agar Speyer had been sort of routed out of Britain. He left Britain in 1915. He had to resign. He was stripped of his British citizenship in 1921, held to be a traitor held to have been someone who'd actually been trading and um, perhaps even corresponding with the Germans during World War I. All right? So his name is Mudd. Now, I think that's pretty unfair, actually, but I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Suffice it to say that this is the view held. All right? So actually, even Albert Stanley is in trouble. All right? He's facing this kind of thing in the House of Commons. Luckily for him, here he comes, and this is his reply. Now, it's nice to see him kind of rebutting this sort of let's be honest, unpleasant nonsense, all right, in these kind of very calm, rational terms. But let's not forget that the times in which he was operating were not calm and rational, all right? They absolutely were not. There was a mob of people who went round to Sir Edgar Speyer's house and smashed all the windows. He had to have police protection, all right, before he left the United Kingdom because he didn't feel it was safe anymore for him and his family to live there. So it's a difficult moment, all right? But he's very lucky um, because, in fact, at the end of his speech, there's a lot of cheering from his side of the house, he gets clapped on the back by Andrew Bonner-Law, who's the Conservative leader at that time, and the Daily Mail writes it up like this. All right? They think he's great. Okay? And thankfully for Albert Stanley, they effectively put the issue to bed. All right? The Daily Mail says, yeah, this guy is good, he's sound, he's passed the test. All right? Not only is he efficient, a kind of an American purveyor of efficiency, which we like. We don't like the, the scandalousness, but we like the, uh, we like the efficiency. But we think he's British. All right? And there's another uh, article that appears shortly after this, which describes him an honest British character, as sound as rock and as honest as day. All right? And he has to pass those tests. He gets his peerage in January 1920. And I think we can say that at that moment, all right, we have sort of set a seal on his social legitimacy. All right? Albert Stanley is OK. He's the kind of guy who we can trust to run a unified transport organization that runs things within the capital city. So I think he has two tests all right, in this long and incredibly tortuous path that we have to move down to get to a unified system, which eventually we arrive at in 1933. And I would argue that the rationalist arguments, I think, are relatively well known in the sense that, yes, surely a large organization must be able to take a, a advantage of economies of scale and other rationalities um, that a smaller one can't. I don't think the thing about the degree of managerial information is all that well known, but it's a key part of managing such a large organization. And finally, I think the social aspects of legitimacy that Ashfield has to win all right, in order to be deemed a suitable kind of person to run this outfit, are also not massively dealt with either. But they're all part of this story about how London Transport, as a big centralised organisation, was even allowed to exist in the first place. Because without that, I think it would have been much more difficult, much more tortuous, might have taken even longer, probably would have taken even longer. So there you are. Okay? What does he do? What has he achieved? Well, I think we can all agree that his monopoly of London Transport was efficient, OK, what's perhaps not so commonly thought about is whether or not it was legitimate, all right? But I hope you can see how he won those battles, all right, and why those battles were extremely important. As it says there, the process of actually creating it, depending on winning those arguments first. So my argument to me, which I'm going to throw out to you, and I'm very happy to take questions later on at the end, is the real achievement is not really about the creator of London's transport. It's that he was a person who was sufficiently legitimate all right, that he legitimized that process. He made it okay. It was acceptable. All right? There was someone who could be trusted to run that organization um, uh, once it had been created. Without that, hard to say, isn't it? Who could have been trusted to do it? So let's leave Ashfield alone a little bit then and say we've come to 1948. We have the organization in existence. He's legitimized it. All those battles, by the way, I argue, all right, are all 
pushed away, all right? They're part of a past that people don't really want to talk about because they're quite difficult, as you can imagine, having seen some of the things I've shown you. So we've arrived at this glorious destination, but the sort of tricky way that he arrived at it, all right, is not something that people really want to discuss very much, all right? It belongs to the past. It's not something we want to rake up and bring up and, and, and sort of air our, our dirty laundry in the past and have sort of quotes like the one from Noel Pemberton Billing. What's also not enormously discussed is the, the way that he was able to manipulate or control the legislative environment. And earlier, I talked about the pirate buses, all right? And again, I'm not going to patronize this audience with explaining what they were. Suffice to say that private operators were undercutting his combine, and what he was able to do was essentially legislate them out of existence. He just said, look, I'm going to persuade people in all I'm going to work with people in Parliament to make sure that the Traffic Act is passed, and I'm not going to try and confront them head on in a battle of, I don't know, efficiency or a battle of who's got the comfiest seats or a battle of who's got the cheapest fares. I'm just going to make sure that Parliament says doing that is illegal. All right? Now, I think there are some fascinating parallels there with what's happened with Uber. All right? Let's just make it illegal. Right? We'll just clear it off the street, never mind the competition. Okay? I'll throw that out there for you to think about as we go along. So there's more than one way to crack an egg here. Okay? You can say that, look, I run this marvelous, centralized, rational, efficient organization that is just it is able to invest so much more, is able to have much lower fares, our services are much more dense, much better. All right? That's a nice story. We want that. We don't want the story about how we just changed the law to make sure the competition was illegal. All right? Hold that thought. Hold that thought as we go along. The legacy, okay? Like I said just one moment ago, centralized, rational, efficient, run by experts, men you can trust, okay? Not like those dodgy spares and, and yerkies. So here's the question from a kind of an economist perspective. What happens to an organization when you have exhausted all the gains from scale that you can wring out of the orange. All right? And let's be honest, when you bring a lot of separate organizations together, there are enormous efficiencies you can bring out of it. You can cut back on administration. You can centralize all kinds of processes. You can vastly reduce the costs of acquiring new equipment. All these things that you will be very well familiar with yourselves from your careers. But there comes a point when there are no more efficiencies to get out of it. All right? Now, I don't know when that point is. It's enormously difficult to put your finger on it. All you can say is that there, is, there are diminishing returns to scale on this one. All right? And at some point, Ashfield's great legacy of, an organ, of a unified organization is going to stop producing efficiencies. And worse, it's going to start producing inefficiencies. All right? Because in the end, what happens to organizations that grow too large? They become too top-heavy. They become too cumbersome. Okay? They, become, they become problematic. So that's question number one. Okay. Can you continue to just delegitimize your opponents? All right. It's one thing, all right, to crush another bus company. Okay, I'm a bus company, you're a bus company, I'm gonna put you out of business, all right, in a whole variety of different ways. It's quite another thing when your competitor, all right, is not a business, all right, but a piece of private property. Stop and think about that just for one moment. Because a car is not a rival business, all right? It's someone's personal possession, isn't it? All right? And that, I think, completely alters the whole geometry of, um, um, of um, um, you know, the London transport debate. What else have we got, then? Is the trial car true competition, just as I mentioned? And finally, listen, this is one of the, the other things that begins, I think, to, to make itself felt steadily over the years with LT after the war and after Ashfield is... Is London transport effective as well as efficient? And I'm going to explain what I mean there, okay? Efficiency, I think we've talked a lot about. That's extracting the maximum output from the minimum inputs. Quite nice, quite quantifiable, okay? Um, when something is effective, all right, we're asking it whether or not it does the thing that people want it to do. Is that all right, Barry? Is there an issue with them? Is it me, perhaps? Sorry, I'll just stop while we uh, just address this one. Be easier to use that. Do you think I should switch this off? Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. Can anyone hear me? I'll try my mic again. I'll just try my mic again. There we go. Oh, is that what's happening, do we think? 
Sorry, everyone. I apologise for this. Um, there we go. I'll, I'll, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. Super. So there we go. So we're asking whether or not we know that LT is efficient, or we think it is. That's, that's easy to explain. The question is, is it still doing the things that people want it to do? All right. And I think a classic one with this is beaching, just to sort of go off a slight tangent here. All right. Whether or not you agree beaching made the railways more or less efficient, that was his stated aim, what he certainly did was he made them less effective because they stopped doing a lot of the things that people wanted them to do. You often see this issue arising with the NHS as well. You can make the organisation more efficient, all right, but is it actually providing the services that people want? All right. Question that I'm going to pose, um, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, look at, um, uh, we'll look at how and what happens with that in just a moment. So, what I call the shock of the new erupts, and the shock of the new is another way of saying the car, all right? Not an issue that Lord Ashfield really had to deal with, although he had a few thoughts about it. So the question is, what do you do with this new form, well, not new, but new mass form of transport that in a way is not a competitor at all? All right. So you can't portray it as a rival business okay, that's competing directly with you in that sort of sense. And yet, of course, that's one of the outputs. And that makes it enormously difficult to legislate out of existence. All right? So we've seen what happens when people come along with taxis. All right? and we can put them out of business. And we've seen what comes along when people try to operate rival bus companies. All right? and we can put them out of business. But you can't, or it's very, very unpopular if you're going to change the law and tell private citizens that they're not allowed to own a piece of private property, right? That's the difficulty that changes all this. That's what makes this very, very difficult to deal with. So the question is, transport is the carriage of quantity for distance, all right? But is there more to this than meets the eye? Is it correct to see the car, as the post-war chairman we're going to have to get to grips with in one way or another, as a piece of transportation? Or is it actually really a kind of consumer good or consumer service, all right? Did they get this bit right? Because as we saw in the previous picture, and the reason why I pop this up, I'll jump back a couple, okay? What they said was, you're mad to buy a car, okay? It's really inefficient, all right? Look at the 69 people who could all be on this one bus, or they could all occupy 69 cars. But the question I'm asking is, is this really about efficiency, all right? Or is it meeting a much deeper need for issues around status, okay, consumption icons, okay, all these things that a car plays to as well. And we know that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was a whole sort of wash of these consumer goods that appeared, washing machines, televisions, so on and so forth. We all know about that. And the car, all right, essentially belongs to that. The key point about it is it's not just a utilitarian good that gets you from A to B, although it obviously does. It's also a positional good, right? It marks out your social status as you, um, uh, as you progress around the place. And we'll, we'll look at that in a moment as well. So there you go. Did the post-war chairman sufficiently change to understand and take account of that very obvious alteration that was going on around them? Did they correctly size up the car? Would Lord Ashfield have been able to size up the car? as it began to hack away at things. And where do cars and public transport kind of fit together in all of this as this began, begins to change? Quick question, okay, out to the audience. How do, you, how do you beat the traffic home? Do you beat the traffic home in one of these? Okay, or do you beat the traffic home in one of these? Okay, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? There's absolutely no question to any of us, I think, in the room that you beat the traffic home in one of these. Yeah, you want to move 500 people really quickly from A to B, okay, without a traffic jam? It's got to be one of those, okay? Second question. When you turn up at the office or back at home, what would you like to arrive in? <laughs> okay, there you are. Your choice, okay? I'm being a bit mean to um, 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 the underground train there. But there you are, okay? And I think that those images... I would argue, perfectly summarise this debate. Okay, you've got this clash in passengers' minds or travellers' minds between the rational, which Lord Ashfield's organisation, remember, was set up to deal with. All right? It made rational decisions about the allocation of resources on the basis of extremely detailed management information. And then as the consumer boom gets going, post-war, symbolised by lots of things, but that as well, that begins to get undermined by trickier questions about the nature of transport and what it's really all about, all right? That become more sophisticated than just getting someone from, I don't know, New Cross up to the city or something like that. It gets harder. It gets more complex. 
So there we go. The recognition that I'm looking for in my argument from the post-war chairman is that they need to spot this going on and do something about it. All right? The recognition that passengers were gradually becoming customers. So what do they need? I'm going to suggest that they don't need neutral experts anymore. They don't want that. They want consumer champions. All right? So this idea that the organization is governed quite remotely by a set of grandees who are obviously extremely expert in their own areas and they know an awful lot, but are quite insulated from the public, begins to get less and less traction as we go along. People don't want that. It's about marketing, all right? not engineering. Okay? The quality of the journey matters, not just the fact of arrival. All right? This begins to get more and more important. Ambient factors click in. Okay? To do that, you've got to have product sensing capabilities. Product sensing capabilities means decision making has got to be devolved down to the people on the floor all right, who meet the passengers every day and understand what's going on. All right? If everything's taken back to the center, that takes far too long and is probably lost in translation anyway. All right? And we are back in the realm of effectiveness as well as efficiency. Are we doing what people want as well as squeezing out the maximum outputs for the minimum inputs, all right? So there's this big, profound change that goes on. So I'm gonna stop here and just do a very brief pause. I'm gonna check with Barry in a moment about how we're doing for time, okay? And if people wanna ask me briefly questions at this moment and I can get a glass of water, that will be great. And then we will talk about the post-war chairman. How are, we, how are we doing for time? Are we? We're fine. We're fine. I don't know how much more you've got. No problems. <laughs> So I'm going to take a pause and a quick replan, um, but I'm very happy in the, in the pause to, um, um, to take any thoughts thus far. If not, can I just take the time? Am I live on this mic? Yes, good. Um, just to uh, emphasise again that next Thursday's meeting is postponed, though we hope to hear from Frank Messenger at a later date. Uh, the next meeting, therefore, is on Monday the 12th of September here in the Cubic Theatre at Covent Garden. But I'm pleased to say that Howard Collins, uh, Chief Operations Officer with Greater Sydney Transport for New South Wales in Australia, um, for whom we also heard during lockdown by the wonders of remote Zoom technology, um, is actually in this country in September and has very kindly agreed to devote an evening to uh, a talk here at Covent Garden. And I think he's going to update us on some fairly exciting developments in heritage transport in New South Wales since his talk of some uh, 12 or 18 months ago. So uh, we're just finalising the details of that. We won't make it live for booking on the website probably until August when we're certain that everything's in place and uh, how it is on the way here. Uh, but Monday the 12th of September for what I'm sure will be another excellent presentation. So that gets the next meetings out of the way. Uh, and if James has caught his breath back, we can proceed. <laughs> Barry, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And any thoughts? So. One thing that intrigues me is if, uh, if Asheville was a man of huge personal power and, and personality, um, he's so elusive. I know he doesn't leave yes. a diary and so forth, but I know he doesn't leave kind of diaries and so forth behind, but he doesn't, you know, doesn't feature big in the public record. What, why do you think that is? It's an enormous shame that his papers, as I understand it, were destroyed by his secretary on his death. Um, and I think if we knew more about that, it would be absolutely fascinating. Happily, I think we, we might be enlightened fairly soon with some scholarly work on, on that topic, which I look forward to immensely. Um, but yes, as a character, I think um, what he seems to have been extremely good at um, is essentially persuading other people that, <laughs> that his ideas were really theirs, um, which is a rare gift, um, as I'm sure we can all appreciate. Um, and that seems to be attested to by a variety of different people, uh, Menzler obviously amongst them, but you pick that up in other places too, in newspaper reports, comments by his parliamentary colleagues and so on and so forth. So there does seem to be, I think he's described somewhere as a, a profound student of psychology. Um, and I think that will come from someone who would have observed someone who, I think there was a, another junior, it might have been um, Alec Valentine who said that as a junior official in LT, you'd go to him for advice 
uh, and you'd come away sort of thinking that he hadn't really helped you, but over time the answer would sort of come to you on the basis of what he'd offered. And what that suggests to me is very powerful and kind of non-direct questioning, I suspect. But I'm afraid this is all me hypothesizing on the basis of, of what, I've, what I've read. Yes, please. I just want to explore your, literally the last word on that slide. On, on it, normally. Yes. It seems to me that the, perhaps the most important people in, uh, in and around the creation of London Transport in 1933 were its users. And I would contend in those early years, and I would say right through to the mid-1950s, perhaps even as late as the 1960s, the general public perception of LT was that it was good. It was a good thing to have everything under one control. It was a good thing to be able to make journeys across a pretty big area, including country buses and coaches, where I was for some years. And I don't necessarily see why you're saying it was unacknowledged that, uh, that London Transport had legitimacy. Thank you. No, a good, thank you. Very nice point. Uh, what I'm going to say is this. I think that by the time you've got to the 50s and 60s, it is acknowledged, and people can't really imagine how it could be any different because red buses are there, right? They've become a national treasure. I think what I'm talking about are those early battles in, in, the 19, in the noughties of the century where actually free markets and free competition and the idea that small businessmen should be allowed to set up rival coach companies, right, is a really important part of people's way of seeing the world. And I would argue that the, only t the time that that begins to come under pressure right, is the First World War. And the First World War helps the sort of the purveyors of coordination immensely because what it shows, and I would contest this, but what it shows is that for the purposes of wartime, you can bring large disparate activities under one roof. And that's really necessary for the central direction of the war. Um, and war socialism, as it's sometimes been called, endures an awfully long time. But yes, I completely agree. I think by the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, people, yeah, they, you didn't need to fight the legitimacy battle at that point. That was, you know, the, the monopoly was the logical, the logical way to be. But I'm going to come on in just a moment and explain how, in the 70s, I argue that legitimacy began to fray. All right, but we'll, we'll come on to that in just a moment. Do you mind if I carry on at, at this period? We'll, we'll carry on. And we'll, we'll look forward a little bit. Right, so back to the chairman, all right? Is it a fair verdict, all right? Is it a fair verdict that they were placemen or whatever, or non-entities? Um, I don't think so. But I do contend that their understanding of the past was perhaps not as good or as full as perhaps it ought to have been, all right? Because they were bequeathed this national treasure and they fought hard to try and maintain it in a variety of different ways. But I wonder, this is my question, about how much they really understood or cared to acknowledge, perhaps, about those battles for legitimacy that have been fought earlier by Ashfield and how the car, all right, perhaps began to stoke them up again. So in a sense, I should have put it to bed, all right? But as you know, life never stands still, new things arrive, new ways of seeing things, I wonder whether they cared to acknowledge how much of that had gone on earlier. Perhaps some of them did, perhaps they didn't. A sustainable legacy, all right? A question mark here. I think for the, the lucky man up in the top left, as you're looking at him, Lord Latham, yes. I think what I find fascinating about reading the annual reports from Latham's period is actually how little had changed. All right? In those annual reports, believe it or not, I think there might be a mention in the 1953 report. They don't even discuss cars. All right? They're not even mentioned. Okay? What he's concerned about, overwhelmingly, I would argue, both in his personal writings and in the annual reports, is he thinks, wait for it, too many people are on London transport. It's a real problem. All right? He wants to get them off. All right? And that's a doubly difficult problem because he's quite a convinced socialist and he wants ordinary people to be able to use the system. Um, he would probably have liked to have put the fares down further, but he doesn't because he acknowledges the system is already overwhelmed. Right? So his problem actually is the opposite in many ways of what all the others have to contend with. He's got, well, he thinks he's got too many people on. So, Sir John Elliot, okay, and he arrives essentially with a brief to tidy up LT. It's a change of government at the top. The Conservatives win in 1951, and they feel that nationalised industries, there's a sort of hint of inefficiency about them. So he's brought in. What I find quite interesting about 
his period is, again, we just begin to acknowledge the existence of the car, although what's really curious in his writings, and indeed in many of his successors as well, is he thinks the car is somehow un-British. Right? He thinks it's something the Americans do. Right? Americans drive around in lots of cars. It'll never catch on here. All right? People are too sensible in Britain. And I am sort of remain puzzled, really, about how someone who worked in marketing, as he did for much of his life in the 30s and the 20s, right, could have been taken in by that one. But yeah, there's a real sense that cars are for Americans, right? not, for, not for British people. What he does to make it a little bit more efficient is you, you notice that fares begin to drift up under, under Sir John. All right? So yeah, they're never quite as fast as inflation, but you, you notice the fare rises coming in. Sadly, still doesn't able, not able to, write, to balance the books. And of course, he's probably best known for the bus strike, or at least the result, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, which effectively, I would suggest, spells the end of his career um, uh, at LT. So a questionable legacy, I think, but the failure to acknowledge the car is an interesting one. So we come on to Alec Valentine, who um, is, I call, the last of the old guard. I think he kicked off many, many, many years previously as Pick's secretary. He learned it all, all right? The question is, did he learn the right things? So he does actually bring a, a period of industrial peace, as I'm sure you're very well aware. He balances the books again, um, at least on the operational side, which is really impressive. I was very, very impressed when I went through the accounts and had a, a good look at what he was able to do. But I think one of my, my criticism, if anything, there doesn't seem to be any particularly new ideas in this period. Now, no doubt some of you can correct me later on, but we, don't, we have a very, very hesitant start to one-man operation on buses here. All right? And I would argue that that was probably a mistake over time. All right? That caught up. But they're very reluctant to take that one on. The second criticism I would make, and I make it particularly Valentine because he was fares officer back in the 30s, is that the issue of fares is basically put in deep freeze. All right? So Ashfield, as we know, is very, very anti what we would now call zonal fares or standard fares or anything like that. He doesn't like it at all. But that means that LT is essentially, I would argue, handcuffed to a system where you have thousands of individual fares, some of over very, very small distances. Um, there are continual issues with dealing with coinage, of course, as you keep on having to keep on adjusting them up in all kinds of different ways. It leads to something that you're probably familiar with, the idea of course and fares. But nobody can quite make the step, <clears throat> or wants to make the step, to the idea that we might have zonal fares or intermodality, okay, or all these things that come later on. And I would argue... That's a failure, all right, to see what's going on in the wider world. Doubtless you can come back at me later on with these things. Alec Valentine leaves. Um, I think he sadly dies shortly after. We have Morris Holmes, all right. This, I think, or this period to me is, the, is one of real stagnation in a lot of ways. I think Morris Holmes, unfortunately, was a bit unlucky. Um, he was appointed by Ernest Marples. Um, and then almost immediately after his appointment, Labour wins the next election. And I think Labour decides quite early on in its time that it's going to replace the LTB, which is what it is, and it's going to municip municipalise it. And in many ways, Morris Holmes's time is spent just waiting for the inevitable end. I think it's hugely significant, by the way, that he was offered the opportunity to run for the post, um, but decided not to. Now, you might say, well, he knew what a nightmare it was, so he didn't want to get involved in that. But here's the thing. Remember that this is Lord Ashfield's legacy, right? Supposedly something that people are enormously proud of, that people should fight for. But here is an example of the incumbent, right, who actually, by this point, can't wait to be off, all right? Doesn't think it's worth fighting um, uh, for that post when it comes around. We move on to Richard Way, um, who I have an enormous amount of admiration for on the basis of what I've seen. I think he's the first person to try and rethink some of the sort of Ashfield assumptions that I've been talking about. And of course, as we know, at that point, LT shrinks right down. It goes right down for a sort of 30 mile to a 10 mile radius. His job in some ways is very, very different. But he's the first person, I think, to begin to say, look, perhaps we need to challenge some of the assumptions here. Perhaps this is the point, I think, that one-man boss operation really takes off at this period. Out he goes, and this is the point, really, where I think politics really, really begins to be noticeable in the way the organization is run. And the chairman's job, consequently, becomes extremely difficult. It also, I think, <clears throat> represents a point where the organization has to think, or at least political change is moving in a direction where you're going to have to move away from this old-fashioned, or it would seem old-fashioned at that point, system where, in a sense, the governance of the centralized organization is conducted remotely or fairly remotely by the, by the great and the good. And we're going to have to engage with passengers in a new sort of way. And I think the choice that sits in front of people in the 1970s or the late 1970s, Robinson and then his successor is, do we treat our passengers as citizens, all right, 
as perhaps the left-leaning elements of the GLC would like us to do at that point. And this is this a kind of talk about the abolition of fares, or at least the reduction of fares, down to extremely low levels. So you basically say, we're going to throw this wonderful asset open, really, to everyone, all right? And accessibility is what we're all about. Or do we construe our passengers as customers, all right? And we've got to make this work because costs are ballooning, all right? Deficits are ballooning. And actually, we need to only engage in activities that are remunerative, all right, or profitable. So you begin to see that split opening up. And I think this is why life becomes extremely difficult, okay, for his successor. And we know, I'm not going to go into the details of the, sort of the Leslie Chapman incident and so on, but the reason why the legacy, okay, is so difficult at this point is because there is this debate. Our, are our passengers, if you will, Primarily citizens, all right, or are they consumers, all right? What are they? What are they doing? That debate, I argue, is only really resolved finally under Sir Keith, all right, where they unequivocally come down on the side of the idea that passengers are consumers; they are customers. Okay, that is how we are going to understand them, and this organisation needs to be cost effective in what it does. And it's very interesting, by the way, to read the annual reports through all this period and watch how they tonally change, because of course they do. Year by year it's imperceptible, but decade by decade it's very, very visible. And when you read the annual reports from, from the early days, what's so interesting about them is that they are in many ways engineering orientated. All right? There's large sections within them on things like the development of new rolling stock, new scientific discoveries in the realm of signaling, other bits and pieces. There's an awful lot given over to what I would call statistical analysis, the number of vehicle miles run, number of drivers, number of this, so on and so forth. By the time you get to so Keith, all right, most of that has disappeared. All right? There is very little discussion. There's no R&D section there at all, all right? Very little discussion about that at all. What there is is an enormous section that grows to almost half the report, which is very, very detailed financial reporting about how the company has been split up or how all the subsidiaries work, okay, and how all the money comes back into the center. What there also is is a very, very profound change in how these documents are marketed, all right? So there is a large section given over to marketing and the customer experience and so on. And what we have, I think, is a very fair transition, but I would argue, all right, too slow a transition. So did they really understand what there was going on? Charles that says there can change perception of status and the realities of convenience, okay? But they were not susceptible to arguments about efficiency. I'm nearly there. Conclusions then, okay? What we've got is a transformation, or a transformation, I, sh I should say, of corporate control. It's not reasonable to expect the chairman to be Lord Ashfield. They're not. That's not sensible. And a lot of his achievements, I would argue, remain misunderstood, both then and uh, indeed at the time now. Personal ownership, such as we saw with Pat Speyer, um, but definitely Yerkes, gives way to a kind of manufacturing, productionist understanding of how you run organizations through statistical controls which in turn gives way to sales and marketing, all right? The question is, how quickly did LT proceed along that trajectory? <coughs> Pardon me. I think the chairman were too slow. That's probably what I would say. It wasn't fair to charge them with not understanding of the past. It's not fair <coughs> to say, um, um, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, it's not fair necessarily to, to expect them to be Lord Ashfield. But I think it is fair for them to be able to read the runes of the times in which they actually existed. And my critique, if I have one, is that not all of them were fast enough to do that. Some of the later ones got it, got it much faster, much quicker. And this idea that actually c transport, all right, is a consumer good, all right? Now, you could argue that that was probably understood better maybe in the latter part of the 19th century than it was in the middle part of the 20th. But it came back again at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the 20th century. For my money, all right, it's most visible in the area of fares, all right? And I'm just going to briefly conclude here by explaining my point. If we think about what a car is, a set of car keys, all right, it offers this fantastic convenience, doesn't it? I can get in my car at any time I wish and take it to wherever I wish in the UK. And people say, well, not public transport can't really compete with that, all right? Well, you can't compete with that if your system of ticketing is one little individual journey for one shilling, sixpence, threep, you know, halfpenny or something like that that takes you precisely from point to point, all right? You can compete with that if you effectively hand someone an Oyster card and say, there you go, that's the keys to this entire system. Just go on it whenever you want, all right? Now, they took far too long to understand that. They did get there in the end, in 82, all right? But 
that, I would argue, is a, a really, really significant oversight that was missed. And it was because there wasn't this understanding of transport as a consumer good in that way. The second observation is about status. And we had the picture of the Porsche and the, and the underground train earlier, right? Cars confirm status on their owners, don't you? When you own a car, you are saying something about yourself, whether or not you like that or otherwise. And it's important to people, the image that they project to themselves. They feel better about themselves. And people say, well, public transport can't compete with that, okay? It's not like that. It's not a personal good like a car is, but I think it can, all right? I was privileged to travel on the Elizabeth Line for the first time, I think, the week before last, right? When I go into those stations, as I'm sure it is the same for you, okay, I feel privileged to be there, all right? Their sort of grandeur is a sort of status-enhancing thing, all right? I've been to Preston bus station. Maybe some of you have as well, all right? That's not a status-enhancing building, <laughs> <laughs> the Northern Line in the 1970s was, was not a status-enhancing piece of physical infrastructure. All right? So I think public transport can compete, and it can compete by doing things like the Elizabeth Line. It can enhance people's personal statuses. But was that understood enough in the 60s, 70s? I don't know. I don't know. Okay? I'm not sure about the answer to that. So there you go. All right? that's, my, that's my verdict. Understanding the past, okay? No, but I don't blame them for that. Okay? Understanding the times they were in, perhaps not, okay, but there's a little bit of personal, uh, there's some critique that can be made there, okay. Sustainable legacy? I don't think so, all right. I don't think it was a sustainable legacy, but they had to find some way of beating the car. They couldn't legislate it out of existence, which is what Ashfield had done when he was confronted by buses um, uh, and, and other competitors. So there you go. That's enough from me. Thank you very much indeed um, for your attention this evening. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, James. Can I just test this mic? Is working okay? Can you hear me through the mic? Right. Okay. So Stephen is going to uh, walk around so that we can hear your questions. Who has a question or a comment? Uh, first of all, thanks very much for a fascinating talk. I think trying to, to, to summarise one of your key points, um, it seems to me that you're saying the London Transport Chairman didn't really understand how the market was changing and didn't react to it. But isn't that true of the captains of British industry generally at the same, in the same era? And is that uh, what, what's your opinion on that and to what extent... Was this a British malaise, almost, that saw the decline of our manufacturing industry and other industries because there was too much groupthink, there was too much doing it how it had always been done and not recognising that the world was changing until it was too late? Firstly, thank you very much for that question because yes, um, I think, is probably the, the simple answer I can give to that. I mean, I, I think I mentioned, um, um, and I'll bring it up in a moment in my book on this, you know, now, London transport is fascinating because it's a kind of an exemplar of a much wider decline. All right? There's a whole sort of trope of this in academia, declinism, um, um, which traces the history of all kinds of British spheres of activity. Um, we usually write about coal mines, about shipbuilding, about the aerospace industry, about car manufacturing. Um, perhaps it was even going on here as well in, in sort of in tandem with that. What was the cause? Um, I, I'm not going to sound terribly original here. Um, I think complacency, bluntly, and I know I'm not adding anything significant to the debate. I think the writings of people like Sir John Elliott are really, really interesting, um, because like I said, um, um, there seems to be a reluctance. Cars are something else, right? They, we don't want to hear about them. They're not going to happen anyway. Americans drive around in cars. We don't. Yeah. So yes, in essence, I, I would agree. There is, this is a part of a wider story that can be seen elsewhere. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, a question that you, for the end, where you say, you give a guy uh, a oyster card and say, there you are, mate. There's the keys to the kick to the to the kingdom, mm. uh, which wasn't f previously found at many parts in London transport. I'm thinking, pre-war, when you have the shilling all the way tickets f on the on the trams and the, some of the uh, trolley buses, was. Is that, is that indicative of a, of a different way of a way of thinking between the bus side and the and the tram side, or was it just the just the way it was marketed at the time? That's a really good point. Again, and, and thank you for bringing that up. You see, I think there was a trick that was missed, 
right back, we're back in the early days of the century, okay, that first decade between, perhaps even further, about 1890s through to about 1910, maybe. Because as well as the things you mentioned, the shillings all the ways and the workman's ticket strips and all the rest of it, you've got the answer to it right in front of you, right? The two-penny tube, all right? Now, this is where Ashfield, I think, is culpable, right? Because he stamps that out. He doesn't like it at all. And he writes various bits and tracts on it. So it doesn't work here. It doesn't work in, uh, in Britain. We don't have the population density, all right? That works in America. Peck says the same thing. Now, by doing that and by really fiercely imprinting that opinion on the organization. And you can see officials later on in the 40s, 50s, and 60s who are essentially junior or mid-ranking officials in the London Passenger Transport Board who've, who've heard this from above. You know, the two, the two gods of London Transport have spoken on this issue. Um, it means the, it just isn't revisited, I think, soon enough. So yes, I think there were examples right back in the beginning uh, of people, I think, who got it right, in fact. Um, but it, Ashfield didn't like it. He didn't like it. He didn't think it would work. If, if the meeting would allow me, please, um, you talk of inertia against one-man one man buses or one man mm. vehicles. Um, London Transport it wasn't operating in its own legitimate or its own uh, vacuum then. <coughs> it had to face the, I suppose, the creative inertia of the Metropolitan Police and yeah. the Union and indeed uh, the Department of Transport at the same time. So. The, maybe he was, he was picking the picking the, the arguments he could win, rather than the uh, the windmills on the far, on the far horizon. Yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. All organisations operate in what you would call the authorising environment. Um, perhaps one of Ashfield's geniuses was to be able to manipulate that authorising environment in ways that he was you know were, were favourable to him. But you're right, of course. Um, uh, it's not as easy as just signing it off and, and making it happen. Regrettably, Andy. Well, first up, James, um, that was absolutely fascinating, and, and particularly for someone doing my job, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking a lot of this sounds remarkably f familiar <laughs> and very topical. Um, and on that point, given that TfL finds itself at, in, at the moment in a maelstrom, really, at the eye of a storm uh, of a political, a financial, and a, um, and a changing customer base storm, um, or ridership storm, if you will, do you see any parallels today with what has happened in the past, maybe in the interwar era? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And thank you for giving me the opportunity, actually, for, for speaking on this briefly. Very much so. So we're back at this classic impasse, I would argue, that we last got to in the 1970s, right? To what extent is the system there to be accessible, all right, to everyone, or to what extent does it, frankly, have to pay its way? All right? And those were the choices that were thrown up at the last time we hit this kind of crisis of legitimation, which, which has happened before. And I hope that that's comforting in a way, because you know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Things are pretty awful at the moment, but they've been pretty awful before. The organization goes on. The only question is, how does it navigate its way through that particular little minefield to see itself on the other side? So there's the clash, right? You've got the mayor, who I think it's fair to say would like to see more accessibility, and you've got the government who's saying, well, look, you know, you're going to have to explain why you're running all of this if nobody's using it, right? And that, I suppose, is, is the standoff that, that's there. What would I take away from all of that? I'd just say, sometimes you can make the argument on grounds of efficiency, right? I would be cautious about that because of everything we've seen about. I think it's about being effective, all right? It's back to what I suppose I closed on. You can give people the same experience that you can with a car, right, through the public transport system if, and I'm glad that your TfL got here first, really, they've got it already, it's credit cards now, isn't it, forget your oyster. You hand over this, card. ticketing's at the root of all of this, right? You've just got to have one point of access, but TfL's got that nailed, that's fine. The bit is about, I think, maintaining the status of using the system, right, and that's about cracking down on graffiti, dilapidation, crime, okay, or perceptions of crime. That's the ambient factors of travel. And earlier, I think, the organization with the best one in the world essentially got uh, controlled by engineers. Okay, So it was all about the facts of arrival. Are we getting you from A to B? If you've got, if you have arrived, that's great. But it's got to be more than that. So I, I suppose I would say, or I'd emphasize, that it's about the physical appearance of stations, the softer factors. And that will keep people on the system because that confers status on them. So I guess they've got this challenge. Um, 
one bit they've got right already completely, the ticketing, and then it's about trying to keep it a high-status activity, which dropped away, I think, in the 60s and 70s and, and 80s to a certain extent. I'm tempted to comment that in 50 years hence, someone will probably be putting the performance of transport commissioners to the same <laughs> forensic analysis, but, but none of us will probably be here, so never mind. Any, any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. James, great presentation. Um, t two questions, if I may. One is about uh, safety. Um, I mean, in, in the sort of the limited sort of work I've been doing so far, uh, what's remarkable is how little fatalities and accidents appear in the in the literature as a, as, a, as an issue. They do occasionally, mm -hmm. but nothing like in the same way that they would in today's reporting discourse generally. Um, and the second one is, to what extent was was there a voice around business, employers, enterprise that was a factor in these equations? I mean, I've spent the last part of, best part of 30 years helping to write letters to try and get TFL more money out of the Treasury with limited success on behalf of other organisations, not in my own capacity. But to what extent is business and the world of business a factor in the equation that many of these chair, chair, chairmen had to deal with in terms of employers demanding better services or expansion of the system and, and, and so forth? Okay, two, two questions, as you said. So the safety is quite interesting. I think I, I might challenge you slightly and say that once the, the, the traffic convoy, and from about 1912 onwards, began to collect these fantastically detailed statistical records, they do collect accidents. So you, you'll find quite careful lists of injuries. And they took personal injury claims quite seriously, actually. Uh, and there's some quite detailed archival evidence that I've read up in the London Metropolitan Archive where you have sort of minor accidents. People come in sort of claiming for sort of scratched bowler hats and things like that. They're given a shilling and sent on their way. Um, so, in, in fact, they're quite careful about that. In, uh, but, um, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'll, perhaps, perhaps we can chat offline about that, in fact, because but the stats are out there. On the issue of business involvement, about wanting more, um, I've struggled to find that, really. I think the first time I really came across that was the Heathrow extension, all right? And business wanted there to be, um, and, you know, the, the London's major airport should be connected. Of course, there are other projects for that apart from the tube, but the tube won it out. But I think, really, you see, this is the thing. B business defected, right? Business wanted more small lorries and more large lorries, right? It wasn't, it wasn't that interested, I don't think. It was vaguely, I think, concerned about any proposal about fare increases, because, of course, that meant commuters found it harder to get into work. But as for the actual system... I, I don't know. I, there may be archival records out there. I haven't, but I haven't run across it um, myself. Okay. Anybody else? Oliver, Mike's with you, and then the gentleman in front of you. I wonder if you're actually assuming too much power potentially available to the chairman. Um, yeah. Ashfield yeah. clearly was a giant in that respect and managed a great yeah. deal, but all of the chairmen after him were in a you know, much diminished position in many Indeed. ways, and all of them had to respond to the political situation of the time, uh, and some in better ways than others. But yes. I think, in some ways, the the weaknesses after Ashfield are collectively down to quite weak boards that London Transport has had, because neither the chairman nor anybody else who's brought in to advise them was actually particularly helpful about seeing a new way forward. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think you're absolutely right that uh, they didn't really take account of what was going on around them, particularly in, in America, and, and take voice of that. I mean, there are, there are copies of the London Transport Reports in the 50s where there are photographs of mass car parks in New yes. York or wherever, um, systems which were never adopted here. And I'm not so sure it was, as you suggested, it was to do with people thinking... That's for the Americans and not for us. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a lot of thought given to other ways of doing it, other than being more effective at building brilliant new buses like the Route Master. Mm -hmm. and then you build all these new buses, and then you find there's not the demand for them. I mean, they built mm -hmm. 7,000 new buses yeah. in the 1940s after the war. Um, and almost immediately, use of buses and public transport began to decline in the mm -hmm. 50s. So, once again, they weren't really responding to what the public expectation perhaps was. 
and then yeah. get into increasing trouble over that. So, but I don't think you can blame that inconsistency solely at the door of, of successive chairmen. I mean, you could perhaps with the Department of Transport or its equivalent, mm. who've also been peculiarly ineffective as a government department mm. at deciding how they want to do things, and still are, I would argue. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I mean, one thing you're right, perhaps I should have mentioned, of course, is a lot of this is just down to longevity. So Ashfield arguably had about 40 years in, a, in the job, broadly, of what you might call either managing director or, or, or chairman of London Transport. That's a phenomenal amount of time. The, the succeeding chairman had about a maximum of six each, at least, and some of them were shorter than that, as I'm sure you're all very well aware. So, yes, I would agree. Um, um, they just didn't have, I suppose, that same degree of leverage. There is then, of course, the comment that you mentioned about weak boards. Um, I mean, that was brought up by the famous PA International report in 1980. Um, and they said, um, I see what, there might be some, some um, uh, veterans of that period out there right now. They said, look, London Transport isn't really run by the chairman. It's not even really run by the board. It's run by, quote, unquote, the engineering baronies. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some engineering barons out here in the audience, I don't know. So their, their comment was that actually the organisation was controlled, in fact, at the kind of senior level, admittedly, but not a board level. In fact, at the sort of what you might say the strata that sat just underneath perhaps the board. Um, but yes, very much agree with what you said. Okay, is there another final comment? Wait a few moments. Right, before I say thank you to James, I'm going to ask Andrew Braddock to come to the front to bring to your attention. I think probably be easiest if you use this. I think this is the more reliable mic. Thank you, Barry, for your indulgence. Um, this is just to say that around about the beginning of March, I had a mad idea, which was following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we ought to do something to support Ukrainians. So we, uh, in the person of the LRTA, has invented Calendar for Ukraine, which has splendid pictures of that fine country, which is full of electric traction, trams and trolleybuses, many of which have now been destroyed, sadly, uh, through the lens of Mike Russell, many of you also know, is a great international traveller. So uh, we wanted to do this in a responsible way, so through the Dem Disasters Emergency Committee Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, we will be very happy to launder your money uh, and hopefully persuade you if you are UK taxpayers to sign up for gift aid so that the DEC can even get 25% from an unwilling government. Always a good idea. Um, the, the first print of these will be available tomorrow and if anyone's at the NTA meeting in London on Wednesday you could pick one up there. Um, I can't sell them to you of course. The idea is that you make a donation. That's how the Dem Disasters Emergency Committee needs to see it happen. I'd be more than happy outside uh, when we finish to take money from you in a quantity the minimum donation is 15 if you want to make that 20 25 30 35 40 anything up to a large number with noughts on the end we're very happy um, and i would then send you uh, a calendar as soon as we've got them or they will be available i'm not sure if we'll be able to do it through the shop but i'll talk to sam about that certainly i hope we can carry something in friends news about it so 24 lovely pictures, it's actually a, twi it's weird, it's a, what is it, it's a 19 month calendar, uh, so it starts July this year and technically ends in December 2023, but not being very good at maths, I worked out we had to add another four pages to make the thing actually function, so it's got January 2024 as well. Thank you. Andrew, just for the benefit of those who might be watching on YouTube, how should they... Yes, uh, YouTubers, here you are. Um, calendar for, your, for Ukraine, if any of you are members of the LRTA or the National Trolleybus Association or the British Trolleybus Society, you will see details in all their websites. I am hoping that we'll be able to get them into some transport museum shops um, very quickly. And there's also a plan with translation into relevant languages to have them available in those languages in countries like the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, pretty soon. Uh, I'm not sure what we can do with North America because it's much more difficult than ever it used to be, even though the language is the same. So I'll do what I can. But if anyone needs to, they can always contact me and my details are somewhere in the Friends or we can, we can sort that out. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrew, very much. Uh, and thank you to James. Uh, I mean, that really was uh, a perceptive, thought-provoking presentation. I suspect many of us will be going home thinking about this and that and the issues that, uh, and the comparisons uh, that James has raised. So thank you very much. The debate can continue. Uh, James has got his own personal email up there if you wish to engage directly. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you can use the comment uh, section of that to express views. Uh, and of course, there is the correspondence column of Friends News, which I shall be happy to devote to some further thoughts if you have them. So, James, thank you very much indeed. Delightful to see you making the presentation in person this time. Thank you very much. And I would invite the audience to express their appreciation in the usual way. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, rail strikes, hopefully, may be a thing of the past, maybe not. Um, we will see you in September for what I'm sure will be an excellent presentation by Howard Collins. But a, a, a happy summer, rail strikes notwithstanding, in the meantime.